I'm going to go ahead and let the kids make their way back to their classes for their lesson. And today I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And today we'll be looking at the first ten verses of the chapter. <clears throat> As always, I encourage you to bring your Bibles. Have them open. Have your Bible app open. Uh, especially today because we're going to be jumping around the text in order to present this sermon the way the Lord has presented it to me this week. For two chapters now, the Holy Spirit has sporadically mentioned an individual by the name of Melchizedek here in the book of Hebrews. And in particular, in chapter 5, the writer made reference to him on two separate occasions. But before he can elaborate on who this individual is, he pauses. And in effect, he says, I want to teach you the deep things of God, but I don't know if you can handle the truth seeing that you're still a baby in the faith, seeing that you're still drinking milk and feeding on the elementary principles of God. So he challenges the immature readers to move forward in their faith. And not only does he challenge the immature, but he challenges unbelievers as well to move forward. He challenges them who, who stand on the threshold of decision to, to move forward to salvation. Everyone, regardless of who you are and, and where you stand in the eyes of God, has been challenged to move forward in your relationship with Him. And then the Holy Spirit elaborated on the fruit that all true believers bear. We live in a day and time where everyone is claiming to be a Christian. And it's confusing. It's very confusing. But the Word of God says you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know the tree by the fruit. And the fruit that true believers bear is faith and patience. And last week at the end of chapter 6, we looked at one individual who modeled faith and patience like no other. And that was Abraham. And through his example, we learned how we can obtain and really trust the promises of God. And then once again at the very end of chapter 6, uh, the writer makes reference to Jesus being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So who is this man? Who is this man? And why is he so important? Well, other than here in the book of Hebrews, he's only mentioned two other times in the Bible. The first of which is found in the 14th chapter in the book of Genesis. Now what we have recorded in the 14th chapter of Genesis is a battle of four kings against five kings. And we read how these four kings defeated the five. And that included the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the process, Abraham's nephew, Lot, was taken prisoner. Now when Abraham received the, the news, the Bible says he, he gathered a small band of brothers, he gathered a small army and, and pursued these four victorious kings. And eventually Abraham overwhelmed them by night and rescued Lot, as well as all the others who had been taken captive by these four kings. And it's at that moment that we are introduced to Melchizedek. Listen to what we're told in Genesis chapter 14, beginning in verse 18. We're told, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And Abraham gave him tithes of all he had. And that's all we know about Melchizedek. But sometime in an eternity past, God the Father said to Jesus in Psalms 110 verse 4, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here the Father promises Jesus that His character and His ministry will be, li be like that of Melchizedek. So what we have in Melchizedek is a picture of who Jesus Christ is. Everything that applies to Melchizedek applies to Jesus. So this morning we're going to look at the deep things of God. 
things that I've yet to preach on in my eight years in ministry. And how you respond to this message will determine whether you're still a baby in the faith. How you react. So we're going to look at the characteristics that are found in both Melchizedek and Jesus Christ. And we're also going to look at our response. The proper response that we should have because of the greatness of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's read here in Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. We're told, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but was made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. May God bless the reading of his word here this morning. Now the first characteristic that I want you to see about Melchizedek is that he was first a king. We're told there at the beginning of verse 1 that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Now we don't know the exact location of this city by the name of Salem. Many Bible scholars today believe that this is the ancient name for Jerusalem. But we don't know with certainty. We We just know that Melchizedek was a king. In fact, that is what his name literally means. It literally means king of righteousness. And we're told that very thing in the middle of verse 2. Look at what we're told. We're told Melchizedek's name by interpretation is king of righteousness. That's what his name literally means, king of righteousness. But we're also told here in our text that as the king of righteousness, he is the king of Salem, which by interpretation means king of peace. That's what Salem means. It literally is translated peace. So this Melchizedek is not only a king of righteousness, but he is a king of peace. And that is a perfect picture of who Jesus Christ is this morning. Jesus is the king of righteousness. The Father says in Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, And this king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Jesus is the righteous branch. He is the king of righteousness. And as king, Jesus' reign is defined by one thing, doing what is right. Doing what is right. He is the king of righteousness. But not only is Jesus the king of righteousness, the Bible also tells us he's the king of peace. We're told in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is what defines Jesus' kingdom. Righteousness and peace. That's the first similarity between Christ and Melchizedek. They're both kings of righteousness and peace. Secondly, this morning, I want you to notice that they both bring what is needed. They both bring what is needed. We're told in verse 1 of our text that it was Melchizedek who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Notice there. 
Abraham didn't go to Melchizedek. No, the king came to him. And not only did the king come to him, but he brought Abraham exactly what he needed. Again, listen to what we're told in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. We're told that after the slaughter of the kings, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. The king brought Abraham what he needed. And what a man needs after a long battle is a little bread and a little wine to sustain him physically. And this is exactly what King Christ has done for us. Like Abraham, we didn't go to the king. No, the king 2,000 years ago came to us. And not only did he come to us, but he brought us exactly what we needed. And what we needed was bread and wine to sustain us spiritually. And this bread and wine came in the form of Jesus' body and the blood he shed upon the cross. At the cross, Jesus met us this morning. He met us. The King of righteousness and the King of peace came to us and He brought us exactly what we needed. That is the second similarity between Christ and Melchizedek. Thirdly this morning, the origins of both Christ and Melchizedek are mysterious. Look at what we're told in regards to Melchizedek at the beginning of verse 3. We're told that he was without father and without mother without descent, not having beginning of days, nor end of life. Now understand this morning, the Bible isn't saying that this man didn't have a father or a mother. No, what we're being told here is that there's nothing recorded in regards to this man's genealogy. We don't know his family tree. In the Bible, the genealogy of almost everyone is recorded from Genesis all the way to Christ. But not Melchizedek. His his ancestry is mysterious. It's mysterious when he was born and, and when he died. And we're told that nothing is recorded about his beginning of days nor end of life. And the same can be said about Christ. Now we understand this morning that in his humanity, when Christ came to earth, he had a human mother, didn't he? And he had human genealogy. Okay, He also had a human birth as well as a human death. But as we also know, Christ existed long before His arrival here on earth. And as the Son of God, it is a mystery to us how He came to be. In fact, He has always been and will always be. He doesn't have a beginning of days. Neither does He have an end of life. The Bible says He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's eternal. And that is a mystery to us, isn't it? We can't comprehend it. Our frail human minds cannot comprehend that truth that Jesus has always been and will always be. It's a mystery to us. It's a mystery. And fourthly, notice that both Christ and Melchizedek serve as priests. We're told in verse 1 that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. He interceded. He stood in the gap between sinful men and a holy God. He offered sacrifices for the sins of the people. And that's what Christ does as well. He is our great high priest. And we're told at the end of verse 3 that He intercedes continually. Continually. For each one of us. And we're going to talk a lot about that over the next few chapters. So there's no need to exhaust the subject here this morning. We're going to have plenty of time to look at Jesus' ministry as a priest. So this is the order of Melchizedek. This is the order. This is his position, this is his character, this is his nature, this is his ministry. These are the common characteristics between Christ and Melchizedek. They're the only two kingly priests that have ever existed in the history of the world. The only two. Now I want you to notice this morning the overwhelming response that Abraham had as a result of being in this man's presence. Abraham quickly realized on that day that he was in the presence of someone far superior, far greater than him. And that's a big statement because Abraham is the father of our faith. Okay? We're the seeds of Abraham as believers. We're his children, his spiritual children. But notice how he responds to this man's presence. Notice what the Holy Spirit says in verse 4. He says, now consider how great this man was. 
Consider how great Melchizedek was that even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils. Let us consider this morning, church. Let us consider how great Melchizedek was. But more importantly, let us consider how great Jesus Christ is. He is the king. He brought us what we needed in our time of desperation. He's mysterious. He's eternal. Yet he's constantly interceding on our behalf. And when Abraham realized those things about Melchizedek, we're told that he gave him a tenth of the spoils. A tenth of the spoils. Now, spoil literally means the topmost point of a heap. Okay, that's what it means in the Greek. The topmost point of, of the heap. The top of the pile. During this time in history, after a battle, the victors would gather up all the spoils. They would gather up all their goods, their riches, and their properties. And they would put them in a pile. And the top of the pile, the very best of the heap, was presented to the God they worshipped. The best was given to God. A tenth was given to Him. And that's what the Bible calls a tithe. A tithe. That tenth. Our best ten percent is a tithe. And that's what Abraham presented to Melchizedek. He gave him a tithe. Now I want you to notice the nature of this tithe. First notice what we're told in verse 5. Look at it. We're told that those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So here's what we need to understand this morning, church. Under the law of the Old Testament, during Old Testament times, God commanded the people to give a tithe, to give the first 10% back to Him. And the ones who were assigned to take up those tithes were the priests, the sons of Levi. So in order to take up a tithe in God's economy, you had to be a priest. And the only way you could be a, a priest if, is if you were a descendant of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. And we're told in verse 4 of our text that those descendants of Aaron were commanded by God to take tithes from the people. The people were re required to give a tithe to the priest who were descendants of Aaron. But notice this morning, Melchizedek wasn't a descendant of Aaron. Notice it. He was a different priest with a different lineage. And we're told that very thing in verse 6 of our text. We're told that Melchizedek, whose descent is not from Aaron and the tribe of Levi, received tithes from Abraham. Abraham wasn't required to give this man anything. He wasn't required by God to give him anything. Yet this great patriarch, the father of our faith, gave him a tithe. He gave him 10% of the spoils because of his greatness. Do you know what that means this morning? It means that Abraham, it means what Abraham gave this king, this priest, was a voluntary gift. It was a voluntary gift. And that's what we should be giving our king, our priest, a voluntary gift. We should be constantly giving Christ gifts because of the greatness of who he is and, and the greatness of what he's done for each one of us. Amen? Amen. Like Abraham, we're not required to give anything this morning, church. We're not required to give anything. What Christ is seeking is voluntary gifts. That's what the king is seeking from those who understand his greatness and the greatness of what he's done for each one of us. Voluntary gifts. And notice who the ultimate recipient of our gifts is. We're told in verse 8 that men, that here men who die receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. So here's what's happening whenever you give your tithe on Sunday morning. 
here on earth, you are placing your tithes in the hands of men who die. Brian and Donnie are going to die. That's just a fact of the matter. But when you place that tithe in your hand, you're not only giving it to men who die, you're giving it to the one who's there in heaven who lives forever. That's what's taking place on Sunday mornings when we pass around the plate. You're giving it directly into the hands of Christ. Jesus Christ receives our gifts. And notice what comes as a result of these voluntary gifts. We're told in verse 6, Melchizedek, whose descent is not from Aaron and the tribe of Levi, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. Abraham already possessed all the promises of God. But because of this voluntary gift to Melchizedek, he was blessed by the king. And that's what happens when you give Christ your best right off the top. You are blessed by the king. And those blessings are not on sure this morning. They're not on certain. No, the Bible says they're guaranteed. When you give Him your best 10%, your blessings are guaranteed. We're told in verse 7 that without contradiction, without discrepancy, the less will be blessed by the better. You will be blessed by the King of Kings. You will be blessed this morning, church. Now as believers... We, just, we, like Abraham, already possess the promises of God. You already possess all of His promises. Everything that God has promised us awaits us in heaven. The question today is, are you experiencing the blessings of God here and now? Are you experiencing the blessings of God? And the one thing that unleashes His blessings upon our lives is our willingness to voluntarily give Him our best right off the top. So I ask you, are you giving Christ your best? Your best 10%? Right off the top of the pile? Or are you giving Him the leftovers? The scraps? I mean, what's, what's, what's uh, the demeanor of Christ's face when he receives your tithe on Sunday morning? Think about that. What would his face look like? Because that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Are you giving him your best or are you giving him the scraps? Here's what I want you to do, and this will tell the story. This is your homework this week. Last few weeks, you've received your giving statements for last year. And by now, most of you have received your W-2s, which states your net income for 2019. I want you to take that number that you gave the Lord and divide it by your net income. Not not what you take home. No, the Bible says it's the best 10% off the top. Your net income. See what the number is. See what the percentage is. That'll tell you if you're giving him your best or if you're giving him the scraps. That's going to tell the story. And I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do, church. I'll lead the way this morning. I ran our numbers, and last year, Angie and I, our number came in at 14%. 14% off the top. For Christ and His kingdom. Now I'm not sharing that information with you to put myself on a pedestal this morning or to brag. I'm sharing that information with you because as your pastor I should be leading the way. I should be out front giving more than everybody else. Giving more than everybody else. God ain't going to bless a pastor who doesn't do that. He's not going to bless a church. It's not going to happen. Now understand, Angie and I didn't get to that percentage overnight. Okay, You need to understand that. It took us 20 years to get to that point in our walk with God. We started trusting God with a little bit. 
And you know what we found out? He would pour out a lot. He would pour out a lot. It wasn't even proportional over the last 20 years. Look around you. Is this proportional? What we have here? So we'd trust him with a little more. And a little more and a little more. And he'd heap more and more and more blessings upon us. And without contradiction, the less has been blessed by the greater. Without contradiction. And I promise you this morning, the same thing will happen in your life if you'll trust Him in this area. Not because I said it. Because God says it. Now I realize this morning that trusting God with your money is the last thing you want to do. I realize it. It's hard. Let's be honest. The last thing most of you wanted to hear this morning is a message on giving. I'll have you to know this is the first time I've ever preached on it in eight years. Because that's where we're at in Scripture, and I'm going to preach it all and not apologize. I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. I also want you to know this morning, some of you are thinking, well, he's in it for the money. Well, let me tell you something. If I was in it for the money, I wouldn't be in Cana, Virginia. And that's just the truth of the matter. I'd have took some other job. No, I'm sharing this with you this morning because I want you to be blessed, church. I want you to be blessed. Money, it's the one thing we all want to hold on to. We all want to hold on to it. We think we're going to take it with us, that somehow it defines our success. Do you know what defines your success? Whether or not God pours out His blessings upon your life. That's what defines our success. And if you want God to pour out blessings upon your life, you need to test Him. I challenge you today, you test God. Test Him and see if it's not true. Don't take my word for it, take His word for it. We're told in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, look at it. He says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, your best 10%, that there may be meat in my house and prove me now. God says, test me. Test me in this one area. Test me in your giving. I will open up to you the windows of heaven. The windows of heaven and pour out upon you blessings. And there shall be no room enough for you to receive it. More than you can handle. More than you can handle. Test Him. Test Him and see if His promises hold true. I challenge you. Test Him. This morning, if you're having money problems... If you're having money problems, you cannot afford not to do this. God doesn't have money problems. Show a little faith and see what you get in return. Just a little bit of faith, church. I've tested it and He's poured out upon me more than I ever deserve. Never lack for anything. And I believe it's because of this one area of my life. I believe it. Here's what I know as your pastor. Here's what I know. If God has your wallet, He has your heart. He has your heart. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. And if God has your heart, you're never going to be forsaken. He's going to bless you. He's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that you can't possibly even receive. Blessing after blessing because you trusted Him in this one area. And as those blessings pour out upon your life, you're going to need to know how to properly manage them, aren't you? And that's the reason we're offering financial institution. God's time is impeccable. Financial peace on Tuesday nights just so you can handle the blessings. So you know what to do with them. There you'll be given the tools to help you financially, to be successful. To be successful. We want all of you to be successful financially. I don't want anyone to struggle. This is where it begins, though. The journey begins right here, giving your best right off the top. Not the leftovers. Not the scraps. Your best. 
And why should we give Christ our best right off the top? Because of the greatness of who he is. Because of the greatness of what he's done for us. We give him our best this morning because he is the king. The king of kings. The king of righteousness and the king of peace. We give him our best because he gave us his best, right? Gave us his best. He gave us his body and poured out his blood so that we would have exactly what we needed. Forgiveness of sin and a home in heaven. Peace. Hope. We give him our best because he's eternal. If we're going to give anyone anything, it should be the one who lives forever. The one who lives forever. We give him our best this morning, church, because he is continually, constantly interceding on your behalf. When the Satan is accusing you before God, Jesus steps in and says, Nuh-uh, he's one of ours. He's mine. This is why we give him our best. Because of the greatness of who he is. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today. And I pray that people see that our giving is not a requirement under the New Testament. It's a gift that we voluntarily give because of what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that the people would test you in this area of your life, of their lives. That they had quit trying to build up their kingdom and build your kingdom. And Lord, they'll be blessed in return. Lord, that you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that they've not even imagined. Now, Lord, we know that in a group this big, that Lord, there's those here this morning who don't believe it. Who don't want to hear it. Who don't want to give it. Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you'd soften their hearts and help them to realize that, Lord, what we want is for them to be blessed. It's what you want. Lord, help them to take a long look and see what they're giving. Not for my sake, Lord, for their sake. Lord, we want the best for the sheep. We want them to be prosperous in every aspect of their life. And Lord, we want you to rain down your blessings upon them. Lord, I pray that you bless this group of people. Lord, we believe it's divinely ordained that this group of people heard this message today. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in our midst. Lord, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.